I'm excited to start 2018 with two amazing guests, a 70 and an apostle of the community of Christ, John Hamer and Lachlan Mackay. I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit more here in a minute, but we'll be talking about some LDS myths as well as the Kirtland Temple and how it was constructed. Check out our conversation. The other thing I want to mention is our latest uh, transcript is for sale. It's half off on David Connie Nelson's Nazi, Mormons in Nazi Germany. So to check out this week. Here's your week to get it for half price. Now back to our conversation. Welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast. This is a star-studded um, podcast. I'm excited to uh, talk to an apostle in the LDS Church. We don't get to do that, period, I don't think. I do want to talk to Dallin Oaks. Uh, he wrote a book on Joseph Smith's martyrdom one time, but I have a feeling he's probably not going to say yes. So. <laughs> so could you introduce yourself? Sure. Lachlan Mackay, uh, member of the Council of Twelve and Community of Christ, and I oversee the northeast field in the U.S., which is Michigan, and basically Kirtland to Maine to Virginia. I have functional assignments, including Community of Christ Historic Sites, I oversee historic sites, and lead the Church History and Sacred Story team. Okay. That's awesome. So also we have a podcast extraordinaire, John Hamer. <laughs> I know you've got a list. I remember seeing that one time. I should have looked it up where you talk, you showed all your interviews on, on the blog. Yeah. Um, well, the ones I remembered. Anyway, I tried to put it all together onto a list, but it is whatever. It's a dozen different podcasts, but then 100 episodes or whatever. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. So, so podcaster yeah. is well, one of the Why things. don't you give us a little bit of an introduction. My sister is new to Mormon history, so she's probably not even heard of you. Mm. I think you're a little bit of a, a minor celebrity. <laughs> 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 Introduce uh, yourself to those who, who aren't familiar with you. Um, well, I, uh, I guess in terms of the history work that I do, uh, I primarily have studied the broader uh, Latter-day Saint tradition churches, and so that would be like I say, all manner of ites, <laughs> you know, so the Strangites and especially, but also, uh, you know, Cutlerites and Hedrickites and, and everybody else. Uh, Josephites, our tradition. I'm a member of Community of Christ. Uh, I serve as the pastor of the downtown Toronto congregation. Um, I've been called to be a 70, and so I'm a 70 designate, and that's going to, the ordination will happen in October. Um, I also... Uh, I'm a past president of the John Whitmer Historical Association, which is essentially uh, the other ites or the Community of Christ version of uh, the Mormon History Association. Um, those kind of things. <laughs> yeah. And you've been interviewed a thousand times, probably. <laughs> a bunch hundred, of times. I think. <laughs> All right. You also podcast with Infants on Thrones, I believe. Podcast on Infants on Thrones as a regular panelist, and then... Yeah, that's the regular gig. <laughs> so. well, one of my favorite blog posts was, gosh, it's probably been a decade now, um, the top myths about the community of Christ for Mormons. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the top Mormons. 10. Yeah, top 10 myths. Yeah, I don't remember exactly how it was, but our top 10 Mormon myths about the community of Christ or something like that. Yeah. And that one um, we ended up doing, there are a couple of podcasts with that. I think we did one on Mormon expression that was on that same topic. And so... One of the ones that, uh, for the LDS tradition, the one of the blog posts that um, people it gets the most traction is for whatever reason, like sometime in your curriculum, every spring you do the milk and stripping story. Yes. <laughs> and so then suddenly this, this essay, this essay that I've written that has been read more times is on the milk and stripping story because every May or something like that, it comes up for some reason. <laughs> anyway, in the LDS, I don't know why. No, that was just a few weeks ago, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so that one and then the, uh, I can't remember, the, oh, the other one's the Spalding. So I have one called the Spalding Fable. And so anytime the Spalding story comes up, that one also. So, wow. yeah. I'm going to try to keep this uh, this to you know about two hours, but I could probably could talk to you guys for two hours ten times probably. So <laughs> at any rate, um, so yesterday, I, actually, I guess I should ask, why are you guys here in Salt Lake City? I was Sunstone, so I mean, uh, I've been coming to Sunstone for over a decade. I'm. Uh, you know, I mentioned MA, uh, JWHA and MHA. Uh, in general, I'm just very much in favor of uh, all of these independent uh, community building institutions within the broader Mormon tradition. And so Sunstone's an amazing one of those. And so I, I enjoyed this conference and came for that. Okay. John here for Sunstone, coming off and on for years. And uh, it's harder and harder to get to academic conferences. 
Um, and so I was able to get to this one and reconnect with a lot of friends I hadn't seen in a long time. Now I know I tried to meet up with you at the Mormon History Association, um, but we, we weren't able to hook up. So I'm glad you, you came out this way. So that yeah. was, this was great. It would have been a shorter trip for me to St. Louis from Nauvoo, but, <laughs> but thrilled that we could connect. Now are you based out of Nauvoo? Is that where you are? Yeah, Nauvoo's home. Born and raised in Jackson County, Missouri, 15 years in Kirtland, Ohio, and I've uh, been in Nauvoo since 2007. Well, great. My current interview that I just posted up uh, t this morning um, was with Jim Von Cannon, mm -hmm. and he's a member of the First Presidency of the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And when I spoke with you yesterday, you told me that you knew him. Tell, tell how yeah. you knew him. I went to high school with Jim, um, and my uncle Fred Larson is the, the prophet president of the, the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I uh, have had a chance to reconnect with Jim through the years recently. Oh, wow. Wow. So. That was a fun interview. So, um, now F Fred Larson is, is the prophet president of the Remnant Church. Um, how is he related to Joseph Smith? How is Fred Larson related to Joseph Smith? So, his uh, mother was Lois Smith Larson. Her father was Frederick Madison Smith. His father was Joseph Smith the third, oldest surviving son of Joseph and Emma. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the tie in there. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I shouldn't ask you about the Remnant Church, but. Um, as I understand it, they're, they're, they've gone back to the old RLDS tradition of lineal succession. Um, do you have any idea, I should have asked Jim this, but do you have any idea who would be the next prophet? When not had a chance to talk to, to Uncle Fred about succession in the remnant, but that would be a, an interesting conversation. Maybe a, a Christmas we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll have to get you back after that. <laughs> So great. Um, so one of the things that I love, I know John uh, gave a, a podcast uh, on Mormon Expression a while, uh, several years ago, I guess it's been now, about the Kirtland Temple. And uh, in talking with Dr. Richard Bennett, my, my name twin, um, he had mentioned that now, your name is spelled, I would say McKay, but you pronounce it Mackay? Yeah, Mackay. My father's Australian and they held on to the Scottish pronunciation. So uh, Mackay, but it's the same clan, McKay, Mackay. Mackey, all the same clan. Oh, really? Okay. So, by chance, is that David O. McKay? Is that, is that a, uh, so a distant relative? I'm sure that David O. is a distant relative somewhere back there. <laughs> I had a friend who was kind enough to do a, some DNA analysis on me, and uh, in his database at the time, my closest living relative was in Utah. Oh, and we had a common ancestor somewhere in the last 500 years. <laughs> I don't know that it was that close. But <laughs> wow, okay. Well, that's interesting. So potentially related to a couple different prophets. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Kirtland Temple. Um, so uh, in talking with, with Dr. Bennett, um, we, we talked a little bit about um, how, how the temple was constructed. Mm -hmm. and it, as we look at the temple today, it's it's a white building. Um, it's, and I, I don't know how how the construction was, but from what I understand, back when it was first built, it was more granite looking. In fact, I'd heard that they'd actually painted mm -hmm. lines to, and so it sounds to me like it looked a lot more like the Salt Lake Temple today. Or, you know, it was kind of a faux granite, I guess. Um, could you talk a little bit about that construction process and what was involved with that? Sure, yeah. They hoped to build a bricks. That didn't work out so very well. Um, so they shifted their attention to uh, what they hoped would be a cut stone look. It would be the, the, the nicest building you could put up at the time if you could afford it. And, of course, we couldn't. Uh, so Artemis Millet, new member, comes down from Canada, brings with him a building technique new to the Kirtland area. The idea is to gather rubble, in this case sandstone of different sizes and shapes, and using mortar to hold that rubble together, they build a wall about two feet thick, about 45 feet high, and then they immediately apply a hard plaster or stucco finish to the outside. They had crushed old crockery and glass and dumped that in, uh, and so that when the sun hit it, it would sparkle brilliantly. And then they painted mortar joints on the wall. So as you suggest, from a distance, it looked like big cut stone block. Up close, you'd discover stucco and paint. It's white today described as blue in the 1830s, which I think is really a slate gray. They also had dipped the wooden shingles into a red lead paint to preserve them. And the front doors were olive green. So pretty colorful early on. Wow. Tragically toned down through the years, but, but structurally really amazingly intact even today. Wow. So it's, it's amazing to me that those walls were two, <coughs> two feet thick. Um, it, it's kind of interesting to, to tour um, the temple. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with John and Locke. 
In our next conversation, we'll talk about differences between RLES and LES theology with regards to the sealing power and the vision of Elijah in the Kirtland Temple. We'll also ask if other groups did baptism for the dead. And so in some of the traditions that continued, so they had the same thing. So when James Strang uh, gathered people to Vorey, Wisconsin, uh, they're building a new temple, they've laid the foundation, they're getting ready to do that. But the saints there are, are also worried about their relatives and ancestors, people who have died uh, that are close to them. And so they also got from James Strang a special dispensation to, uh, to do baptisms for the dead. I think it's the White River that's there. So there's oh, really? so and so those so that kind of thing has happened within the tradition. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you like our page on facebook.com slash gospel tangents. You can subscribe at YouTube at youtube.com slash gospel tangents. We're also on Twitter at gospel tangents, as well as make sure that you subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss any of our episodes. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our videos. Thanks again.